All right. Are we live? It says preview. It says we're live. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Good morning, everybody. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Caliber Corner episode number 157. We're angry. We're aggressive. We're all jacked up on caffeine this morning, and we're ready to talk about tiny guns. All right. So today, episode number 157. Today's topic, compact and subcompact pistol general discussion and recommendations. And uh, before we get into that discussion, we're going to go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves. I need to apologize. I've only got about an hour this morning. we got to be done. I've got a little project I'm working on this morning with some family members, so i got to get going. But it doesn't mean we can't deliver some great information to you. Talking about this category of firearms, which is very, very popular right now. And interestingly enough, when I go to the gun store, there seems to be a decent selection of compact and subcompacts, at least subcompact pistols that are in stock. So maybe people are thinking about going that route instead of the compact route. But before we start that discussion, let's go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves. And we will start with the one, the only, the fantastic Kingpin, everybody. Give it up. Give it up. Kingpin, how's it going this morning, man? Uh, not too shabby. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me, Travis. All right, man. Hey, I love the uh, the sentimental gun, sentimental guns video that you made. That was awesome. It was fun to listen to it, and it's kind of neat to just kind of take a step back and think about the firearms that we've acquired and why. You know, it's kind of cool to kind of just stop and just kind of let those memories come back. So, anyway, I appreciate you tagging me in the video. You guys check out Kingpin's channel. That's a great video. And uh, you got anything else in the works right now? You got any ideas for any videos you got you might be coming up with or? Uh, you know, there's there's always something something coming around but uh i wanted to thank you for for taking your time to shoot the video i know that you're busy and stuff like that so i appreciate you getting it done yeah it's just it's a very short evening for me by the time i get home and we do dinner it's like okay i've got about three hours to figure out what to do with my time some of it includes planning for the next day too so unfortunately but we'll we'll the the, the free time will come my way i'm not too worried about it so but anyway man I, I appreciate it it's awesome you guys check out the kingpins channel make sure you get over there like and subscribe all right. Up next, we got Defense Dad. Defense Dad, what's going on, man? What do you know? Living the dream, man. Living the dream. Every day. Beautiful Nebraska. It's beautiful out there this morning. Did you get outside this morning yet? Uh, it's 8 o'clock on a Saturday. And I, yeah, I know. To I know. Up. You didn't. You didn't <laughs> All right. I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying. All right. Hey, uh, give, us a little, give us a little tease here. What's coming up on the channel? You got any fun stuff lined up? Uh, yes. Yeah, I haven't shot anything lately. Uh. Still working on the on the budget, you know, versus beauty comparison ones, and I got I got some equipment I'm going to review too. So cool. And I'm going, do, I, I'm going to be doing the uh, uh, sentimental gun since you tagged me on it. Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to see that, man. That's going to be awesome. And you know, it is a little hard for us working men to actually get out to the range before the sun sets because we're running out of daylight every day. So well, I work day. eleven to seven almost every day, and it's sunset oh. at seven here, so. Man, you're just got to just you want to wake up call like five when I get up in the morning, and then you can just get yourself ready by six and head out to the range for a couple hours. I can oh, I can arrange I that. Get you the kid out of school by eight. So. <laughs> just let her walk. That's what we did when we were kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, I appreciate you being here this morning. Thanks for getting up, and uh, it's going to be a good show. And I know you're you know you're a fan of compact and subcompact pistols. You've got kind of a neat little collection going on, so it'll be fun to get your take on it too. So. All right. Yeah. Okay, Squib Load in the house. Squib, you got your coffee? Are you fully caffeinated now? I have my Speedway 100% Colombian coffee, and uh, I'm about a quarter through it. I'll tell you what. I brewed up a pot of that. I took one of the little packets uh, up to work, and I brewed one. We had uh, parent-teacher conference night, so from like 4 to 7, we had to make phone calls and emails. The department was completely jacked on caffeine. It was awesome. <laughs> I brewed up the pot. People were like, is that coffee? So like walking over with the mugs and then like an hour later, man, it was just, it was, it was like magic. That stuff is, went over really well. It did go over. That's good coffee, dude. Very good coffee. And it's so basic. Uh, the best thing about try... it is it's just such a, yeah. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's the lag. Oh, no. I was going to say, I, I love that stuff, man. No, what are you going to try? Uh, I'm going to try to get uh, some more of the Paco's Highlander Grog tomorrow. If they're out of stock, I'm going to try again next week. Uh, no guarantees, but if you want me to send you a bag, another bag of it, just let me know. No, if I, I get it. I got to get it. the Arbuckles. I'll be good for now. You go ahead and enjoy that. Is that seasonal with those guys? No, but I think it's their most popular one, and they sell it in half-pound bags. So... Even though they've got multiple locations, they only sell the Highlander at the old old location where they've got the biggest gift shop. So uh, that just makes it more difficult uh, to get. Uh, it's just um, it's popular. They just run out of it. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's it's a good coffee, man. I mean, you almost you basically don't even need any creamer for it, which is the best part about it. You don't have to add any flavor to it. It's just perfect as is when you brew it. So it's good stuff, man. Sweet, sweet, sweet. All right. Okay, moving on. Single shot. What's going on, man? How's it going? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad sitting here stuffing my face. Getting, uh, hey, it's, that's all right. Getting ready that's right. to start the day. And uh, pretty foggy out here in uh, Oklahoma there this morning. Oh, yeah. Hey, would you be able to adjust your mic a little bit for a bit more volume? Can you boost that a smidge? Yeah, sure. There you go. Cool, cool, cool. You're good. You're good. So, yeah, you know, when you get in those, the kind of that, that kind of Great Plains area, man, those mornings, you get a lot of, lot of mist and a lot of fog coming off the fields. It's real flat, River Valley crap going on. So, whereabouts oh, are yeah. you by Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Western yeah, Oklahoma? About, a, about an hour, hour east of Tulsa right now. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Now you're just about directly south of me at this point, so. <laughs> One of these times cool. I'm going to get out that way. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Definitely going to have some road trips coming. When I get a day off, we'll actually, we'll actually, you know, going to make this stuff work. This summer is going to be great too, so. Yeah, sure. Awesome. All right. So let's just uh, see who's out there on the panel. Real quick reminder, today's episode is brought to you courtesy of SS Pond of Lexington, Nebraska. When you go out to central Nebraska, just off Interstate 80, um, it's really the only paved two lane road that runs through, you know, uh, Nebraska for the most part. Uh, you can stop in there, say hello to Stan, check out the firearms, take the exit for Lexington, Nebraska. Stop in, say hello to Stan, and SS Pond will take care of your firearms needs. Man, we got a lot of people. You guys are chatty out this this morning. I think everybody got up this morning. They're watching their cartoons. They're having their breakfast cereal. They're, they're drinking their coffee. So we got poor conservative, gun-loving grandpa, Drusifer out there, mad sexies out there, G23 in the house. I'm over there, apparently. Uh, let's see here. Kingpin's over there and over here. Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep guy. Sam of Anarchy. Zinger. John Lowell's out there, too, this morning. Ozzy Orsborn in the house. Sam of Anarchy. Scott P79. And William Trader's out there, too, this morning. The Black Bear Forge. Good morning. So I'm going to put a little link over here on the YouTube chat for you guys. This is a great article. Um, so we don't argue size for the next hour. Uh, I just kind of have a, an article that more or less puts out the specifications for what is it that classifies a, a firearm as being compact versus some comp, subcompact versus large frame. And, and as you know, in this in this discussion on these pistols, there's a lot of in-betweens that are out there. You have a lot of guns that have like a full-size frame with a compact slide or they have a full-size slide with a compact frame, whatever. You know, you get all kinds of different variations on it. But, uh, you know, the compact, again, there, there's a lot of these models that are in stock when you go to the gun store. It seems like the full-size models are the ones that tend to sell out a lot. But I see a lot of compacts and subcompacts out there. Um, so just real quick, let's just get the specs out there. What's considered a compact handgun and what's considered a subcompact? There's just two simple ways you can look at it. So when you're talking compact, we're talking about a barrel length between three and a half and four and a half inches, uh, slightly smaller than a full-size barrel. Generally, the pistol grip on a compact will fit the user's hand without a magazine. Not always, but generally. Contrary to full-size pistols, less of the grip is expo exposed below the fist. And then for your subcompact models, a subcompact pistols have significantly smaller frames, barrels, and grips when compared to a full-size pistol. Generally, any barrel between three and three and a half inches classifies the pistol as a subcompact. Additionally, the grip on a subcompact is insufficient when holding the gun without a magazine. And again, depends on the model, depends on the pistol. There's always exceptions. But that's basically what we're what we're looking at here. So there's a lot of pros and cons depending on which model uh, you're looking at. And me, I actually, it's weird. Like, I enjoy shooting a compact model more but I daily carry a subcompact just because of the thinness and the smallness of it. Um, so real quick, let's, let's kind of get into it. Do you guys just have any favorite uh, compacts and subcompacts that maybe you recommend that you shot? I mean, for me, Smith & Wesson Shield's been solid. Any of the Taurus G Series, the G2C, G3C. Um, the FN uh, 9C is a great pistol. It's a little bit chunky, but that's a great compact model. Um, I got a Ruger EC 9S. Defense Dad, let's start off with you. Do you have any good recommendations for just a, a carry pistol or a compact or subcompact? Yeah, well, like my daily carry is my favorite one. It's the Walther PPQ subcompact. Uh, I like that because it comes with, you know, I, I carry it with the 10-rounder with the pinky extension, but I carry the 15-rounder as my backup magazine. Yeah, yeah. And that game can really flex into a lot of roles there. And then even though I made some videos seeing some of the cons of small guns, I love the SIG P, P, uh, the P938 and the P238. Okay. Don't have either one of them, but I've tested them. It's about time you sink your teeth in one of those. I think, don't you? About time. I know I want one, but I don't want. Don't, to let, let's let's support each other. When you go to buy one, I'll go with you and I'll buy a gun too. How's that? We'll do this together. 
We'll, right. support you. we'll, I'll, we'll both support each other's addiction and habit. Okay. All right. we, we need a gun intervention in a good kind, in a good kind of way. So, <laughs> there you go. um, what's cool. Like you just mentioned the two different magazine sizes. When you go the compact route, there's a lot of cool things about the fact. One of the things I liked about the, um, the FN nine C it came with three magazines and like two of them, I think were maybe 12 rounders, 14 rounders. And then like the third mag that came with it was a 17 rounder. So, the fact you got that kind of expansion for additional magazine capacity is fantastic. Also, many of those compacts will accept other magazines in the line. You might have that gap from the bottom of your pistol grip to the butt plate of your mag. But that's one great thing about a magazine compatibility across a line. You know, you might be able to carry that, that you know, 17, 18, 20 rounder as a backup magazine. Um, and, and it'll just go right in. Whereas with the subcompacts, you're kind of more proprietary in your magazine choices. You're more limited to just the magazine made for that gun. And then sometimes with some of the compacts, there's crossover models. Like I know some of the Taurus models will accept six hour magazines and there's a lot of or, organic magazines. So you've got a lot of awesome possibilities out there. And then to top it off, there's a lot of companies like on eBay, in case you guys have like, say you got a gap from the bottom of your pistol grip to the bottom of your magazine butt plate because you're using a, a bigger mag. There are companies that are uh, 3D printing little covers that will go over the magazine that'll fill that gap if you don't get one from the factory. So there's a lot of flexibility in the compact pistol, which I think is cool. It's definitely one of the pros, your capacity, your flexibility of use, your capacity issues, your performance. You got a little bit longer barrel than a subcompact. Okay. Uh, Kingpin, what about you? Um, compact pistol preferences. I, I think you could maybe throw the security nine in that, in that category. Yeah, real quick. Uh, my friend just got the Sig P two thirty eight, and that that gun's pretty nice. Uh, what I like about that is it's it's all metal and it's really small, so and it it shot pretty clean, you know. So not a bad gun, but the the Ruger Security Nine, I would I would recommend. It's it's not exactly as short or long, I guess, whatever barrel length as you know you might think a compact kind of a weird would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's really, really light. You yeah. Know? So when you've got it, you don't know. It's 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 not going to weigh you down like a real heavy gun would. Uh, really, I think I, all of us mention it, but really none of us ever talk about it in detail. The M and P series. I have yeah. a shield, and yeah. when you listen, it, it, like to the conversations real closely, whenever we're talking about good guns. Tons of people always mention the MP, MP shield, MP shield, MP, and but we just never have the long, drawn out conversation about it. I would argue that's probably the best series of compact carry guns that are out there. The MP compact line is a really nice looking gun. You know, we're talking under $500, generally affordable, and you know, the shields. I don't remember what the shields bottomed out at. Two, do we ever see a 249? I know what 299, maybe you know, six months ago. Um, well, I, but, thought, I, mean, I thought mine used, so I don't know. Okay, I know that you can tend to find. I want to say 349 maybe. Is 349 to 399 is the price for a Shield 2.0 these days? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that whole series, if you look into it, it seems like Smith makes something that's going to work for everybody. Whether you want the Uber Compact, you know, Bodyguard 380, or you want to go step up to just like the more compact Shield or the large. I mean, I don't even, there's so many different models. I honestly don't even know all of them because they offer, you go look in the case, there's like 15 of these M&Ps. They all kind of look the same, but there's different frame sizes, different uh, calibers, different capacities. I really like the um, the M&P Compact 45. I think that'd be a great gun. I'd love to get a Glock 36, the single stack 45, but they're like $700 online anymore. And I could pick up a, an M&P 45 for, I think, $399 locally. And so that's a that's kind of cool. But yeah, it seems like they do. That's a great line to buy into. So if you're in the market for a compact or subcompact, you know, look at the M&P series. You might find something that's going to work for you. And yeah, the prices well, are decent. Yeah, they got the EZ models. I got yep. the 380 EZ and now they got yep. the nine coming out. And that gun, when you're holding it and you hold like a holster in your right hand and your gun in your left, you're going to have a hard time telling which one weighs more. I mean, yeah. the, and so for a carry gun, the recoil is, I know it's 380, but with it weighing like a piece of paper, there's no recoil to it whatsoever. So you add the EZ series in from MNP too. Yeah, our family has the EZ 380 and the 9. When I say our family, I'm talking about like my immediate family and then maybe I've got a cousin. I got one cousin on my mom's side and that's it. And she's married and he's totally a gun guy. So when I say our family, I'm always talking about kind of our little conglomerate. Uh, and then also my dad and stepdad. So, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what I, I always say. Our family, our family. Well, it's not me necessarily, but I have access to them. But, yeah, those are great guns. In fact, last night at the sporting goods store, there was uh, 
one of the, the the gun dealers in the store was 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 selling a uh, easy 380 to an old gal elderly lady probably in her 70s i'm guessing and uh, they were talking about the pros and cons of it they're talking about the ease of use on the slide and and you know and she was kind of deciding she wanted to go with the 380 or a nine. She educated herself on guns a little bit. I was listening to the discussion when I was with my my uh, my friend last night, helping her pick out her first gun. And uh, yeah, I mean that's a great series too. I mean I'm not just gonna be a fanboy for it, but they it's I mean to me it's a quality series. I think it's money well spent. So it's a good suggestion, Kingpin. Um, Squibby, what about you? I mean, if you were gonna go, you and I had this discussion before we started. What? subcompact or compact guns maybe that surprised you a little bit or that you found okay to shoot or any experience you have at all so i'm not really a compact or subcompact yeah. guy but the best compact gun i've ever shot is your pt 111 i was so impressed by that gun i said if i need something compact for concealed carry i want to look for one of these sometime and i know that they've transitioned over to the g2c so that's probably going to be what, what I'll uh, buy when I get to that point. And while you guys were talking, I started thinking about it. If Kingpin says the 380 EZ is considered a compact, that's probably going to be the next compact in our family is a 380 EZ. Yeah. But, and uh, can I, use, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, we've, I mean, we've been looking at that uh, for a year now, so more than a year now. So that's probably going to be our next acquisition. I did buy a compact gun years ago, and I don't like it, but one of my sons likes it. So I haven't traded it for something because I'm saving it for him one day. Uh, that's what happens when you get your kids into guns, people. Uh, they, they'll, they'll, they'll decide which ones they want. So, uh, you know, I tried it because I said probably get something. I shouldn't, you know, everybody's saying don't carry a full size, don't conceal carry a full size, but I've just never had problems conceal carrying a full size. But, uh, yeah, G2C, uh, uh, it's a little bit unusual, an M88, which is a compact Tokarev. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, uh, the, the Tokarev uh, M70, which is their 9mm Tokarev. Uh, I, think, I think the uh, M88 is in 9mm. It might be in 762 by 25 Tokarev, like one one of the two, and and uh, you know, yeah. anybody says, oh, I would never do a Tokarev as a as a. I would never recommend it as a beginner gun necessarily. Although there's nothing wrong yeah. with it, but you can get, I think maybe Spear or PPU, or maybe Cellular and Below. They make a defensive grade, I believe, hollow point or polymer tipped um, 762 by 25 round for yeah. just for that purpose. So you can get not and not have to worry about the whole over penetration issue. You can get a defense grade round in 762 by 25. You know. And hell, I, like I said, I've carried my Makarov, and that's got uh, critical defense 9mm Mac loaded in it. And, I mean, I'm not going to recommend that to – I mean, it's just kind of – for me, it's just kind of – it's a fun shooter. I enjoy it. It's just kind of cool kind of carrying around a piece of nostalgia. But I, I trust it in a gunfight. It works. It's not necessarily a, a very potent round. But, I mean, if I had the correct shot placement, I'm not doubting it's going to do what it's supposed to do. But, yeah, I mean, there's well, nothing – those are the great issue, great, great options. Yeah. I considered getting that M88 for my younger son – of course, he just gets nothing but bigger. So by the time I get around to getting it, he'll be like, what do you give me this little gun for, Dad? <laughs> the problem with it is finding replacement mags. And if I can't if I can't uh, find easy access or, or somewhat easy access or affordable access to mags, that that's kind of a turnoff. So anytime I've looked in the past, it's like you can get a gun with one mag, but good luck finding replacements. But the, 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 Mil yeah. the Milserps make an affordable option if you're looking to get a, a compact or subcompact because they've got plenty of them but some of the calibers are maybe a little bit more difficult to find well right now if you've got a 32 acp you can find that all day long right that was in stock last so, night actually yeah that was in stock and yeah. five colts and uh 10 yeah. millimeter there's a few unique calibers that you can definitely get with no issues in most gun stores you know so um, sometimes you might want to pull that old milser uh compact out and dust it off and go well this is all i can shoot right now yeah you know, and you make a you make a pretty good point about the magazines. If you're going to consider buying a compact or a subcompact pistol, really make sure that there's some some aftermarket support out there for magazines. Can you find them? Or if you do, are they forty five, fifty five dollars? And they could just be because there's only their factory options are the only ones out there. Also, make sure there's holsters available for that gun. I've got a lot of people that that message me on my YouTube channel, and they'll be like, "Hey, I'm trying to find a holster for this, or I bought that gun, or this gun. I can't get a holster for it." So you might find an awesome deal, say on a Milser, or you might find an awesome deal on. 
some sort of compact or subcompact, but nobody makes a holster for it. What do you do? You know, so that's and you can get custom made Kydex holsters. There are people that will do it, but many times if they don't have the mold for it, you can't get a holster for it. Um, I do find on eBay, I am able to find a holster for just about every gun I've ever purchased. There's somebody making one for it. Like I did actually get an inside the waistband Kydex uh, Makarov holster. I don't know if I ever showed it off my channel or not, but I had to order it from the the former Soviet state of Georgia on eBay. And it took about three months to get here, but it's nice. It's got like a leather lining in it. It's a Kydex holster. It fits the back off perfectly. It's got an adjustable cant on it. And it's just as good as just about any Kydex holster I ever bought. But the point is, make sure you've got some holster availability. And if you're going to now, guys, if you're new to the gun world and you're going to go buy a compact or subcompact, before you buy that gun, let's make sure that they have ammo in stock for it because there are gun stores that will sell you a gun that they don't have ammo for. So be very wary before you get that gun do they have mags do they have holsters in stock if not look around online before you buy and do they have ammo in stock i think that's a big one so well, i would recommend going back with like a you know squib and and his kind of opinion on the subcompacts uh don't buy a subcompact until you've touched it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because oh, God, yes. God, yes. You, you'd hate yeah. to you'd hate to order something off a line go to your ffl to pick it up and three your fingers fall off the trigger well Mm -hmm. You know, so definitely if it's especially if you're planning on carrying the thing, make sure the gun you're going to buy is going to fit your hand right. Oh, definitely, dude. Uh, you know, look, go go to a range. We, we say this every time we talk about these gun recommendations. Go to a range. If they have a variety of models and you want to get, you know, a, a particular one, definitely rent it if you can. Or if you know somebody that has one, shoot it before you buy it. Um, once you get seasoned to, to firearms and you're a lot more in the know about them, you'll know. Many times you'll know if a gun's going to work for you or not when you handle it in the store. But, you know, you might not know about the recoil impulse. Is it going to be comfortable? Is it going to be uncomfortable? Defense Dad, go ahead, buddy. Well, I was just going to echo this on, on the holster part of it, and I know I'm in the minority, but if anybody else there is left-handed, boy, you got to look at that because you can find all sorts of, of holsters for all guns for right hands. But when I go to look at a gun I like, sometimes I can maybe only find two or three options, and I don't like either one of them. Yeah, try the try the big uh, producers for the holsters first, and if not, you might be surprised if you go hunt around on Facebook a little bit or ask around locally. You can generally find a place that will custom make one for you. It might cost you, it might cost you a little bit more, but yep. it doesn't take them much more in their shop to make it a lefty model. They just don't advertise them as much, but there are places that will custom make them for you. There's also a lot of small shops on on Etsy and eBay that that do custom holsters and if you email them or text them and say hey I, i'd like you know a lefty for this can we just go ahead and work out a deal you know you just paypal them and then they send it to you you can make it work for you but again like you said the lefties is a whole nother dimension that we haven't even covered i mean luckily for more uh more prominent models like 1911s and say glocks and things like that you can usually get a decent selection of lefty holsters in a variety of styles inside the waistband outside the waistband leather kydex and so on but yeah that's a whole nother ball game too if you're a lefty yep all right, and then also uh, single shot. What what would you have to say about the compact versus subcompact? Do you have any recommendations or anything that works well for you? Well, I really haven't done a whole lot with uh, the subs, but uh, uh, I've handled a few of the compacts. Those seem to work pretty well. I like the uh, semi-auto, like the Colt Commander <clears throat> forty-five. Mm -hmm. um, I really hey. don't own too many of the of the uh, subcompacts at all. I got one that I like to toy with a little bit. Single shot, can I get you to boost your mic up just a little bit? It's really hard to hear you, bud. Okay, sorry about, sorry about that. that man. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I got to get up close to this mic. There we go. That's better. Made uh, made for background noise to silence it. But uh, no, I got one that I like to play with once in a while. It's uh, North American Firearms, that five shot uh a uh, little revolver. Oh yeah, we got the whole That's revolver true. game to talk about too. That's a whole other, uh, you know, whole other animal we can tackle too. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody that's looking for something like that at SP one hundred and one, I would highly recommend. Oh yeah, the Ruger uh, SP one hundred and one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you uh, you know. One of the issues you kind of run into with the compact revolvers or subcompact revolvers, if we can even go that route, is you know the many of them have the have the uh, concealed hammer. Or they've got that smooth back on it, so you're stuck with the double action trigger pull. 
And, you know, you may need to practice with that a little bit more to be accurate with it or to really get used to that trigger, especially if you need to do some rapid shots on target, you might be throwing lead all over the place. So, I mean, there's, it's cool. because And the thing is, you know, a lot of those compact revolvers, they come in at very fair price points. You can get some great revolvers, you know, under $450, $400. And I mean, some of them are even under 300 depending on the brand you go with. But, yeah. you know, you might be kind of limiting yourself with the form factor of it with the manual of arms. So, yeah. Um, and also from the YouTube side here real quick, this is a good one to talk about. We didn't mention this. Another good reason to test that gun before you buy it, uh, slide bite. Slide bite could happen. Uh, that's yeah. one of the problems that guys have with tiny pistols. You have to hold it just right. Like I've got a Jimenez J22, and if you don't hold that thing just right, some part of your hand is bound to touch the slide to cause a malfunction. So you really have to like, I mean, it's not, you know, you don't want to like use this thing in combat. I've, yeah, even at the range, I'm like, okay, fingers out of the way back of the palm is clear and I can actually shoot the J22 and it'll run. But like if my thumb rides on the slide um, and again, slide bite again, that can be an issue, which is another reason why you want to consider uh, testing some of these before you take them home. I mean, I think that's huge. Um, yeah, I get, slide, I get slide bite with my P64 and, and I don't shoot thumbs forward. A lot of times I'll handle that thing one handed. It's just the, the size of the gun and the, the size of my hand just don't, don't agree. Well, on my, my, on my Makarov, I put that Fab Defense aftermarket pistol grip on, and that's been fantastic. That adds a whole beaver tail to it, so that took care of any sli any any sting issues I was dealing with when I'd shoot it. And the potential for slide bite is gone. I wish I could show these off on camera to you guys. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it, it adds a whole beaver tail to it. So, you know, you got some aftermarket grip options, but many times you don't have that. If it's a one-piece molded, you know, plastic frame you're kind of stuck with whatever you get another thing too people don't consider is the the trigger pull weight take a gun like the sky series they've got a very heavy trigger pull full double action trigger pull uh you know we're talking like like 10 pounds you know at a minimum also the original smith and wesson bodyguards great guns but man they've got a heavy trigger they take a lot of practice to shoot accurately and i mean the intention for something like the bodyguard i would say is you know close distance we're talking maybe 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 seven to ten yards max if you really. I mean, I'm sure you can train with it and shoot whatever you want, but I'm talking, you know, that heavy of a pull. If you had to shoot it under pressure, if you're not trained for it, might have some issues with accuracy. So, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Is that kind of an issue or not? Uh, trigger pull sometimes on these compacts. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, there's just a few that I mean that I, I definitely could recommend but it does it does come down to personal preference some people really get to enjoy when, when i had my sky cpx2 and i carried it you know for three years and shot it a lot i got used to shooting it i enjoyed shooting it other than the fact that it started having the mechanical malfunctions um it was really a great pistol um so again pro pros on the compact pistols you've got magazine compatibility with other models which means you might not have trouble finding mags you've got increased capacity options um you know with that with that with that compact model versus a subcompact if you can make it work for you as a carry gun you've got increased performance because you're gonna have a longer barrel versus a subcompact um a lot of different options many of these come with multiple mags and you get different capacities with them which we talked about before and you know you might just be used to a particular series and the compact is going to function just like your larger model say you go with a glock 19 versus a glock 17 or an m p full size versus an m p compact now what are the pros you guys of the subcompact pistols that we would go with what are some of the the pros of the subcompact versus the compact well, the obvious choice is concealability. Um, if but if you can do the clothing thing right, there's a possibility that that wouldn't be an issue. But it depends on on your workplace. It depends on your your, your body size. Like defense that I'm like you, I prefer the thinnest. For me, I prefer the thinnest, smallest pistol I can easily conceal. Part of it's for comfort, driving, mobility. Um, but the well, other part is just the printing factor, which nobody's going to think about anyway. You know. But, yeah. yeah. I, I don't necessarily go. I mean that. I mean, White Walther is a fairly wide gun, but I'm just saying, like, the subcompacts, if you... Yeah, I can't carry it at work, unfortunately, because of my job, but if I could... You know, uh, I work <laughs> a lot, so... Yeah. That, yeah. That's where something, you know, like... You know, even, like, the Ruger LCP2 or something like that would be a, a good just for a concealed carry. It's not, not what I want to carry every day, but if I just want to carry it in a pair of shorts or something in the summertime, that's where I, I see the advantage to those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and, and I've gotten used to the, um, and I'll tell you what, when I've got my, my Ruger EC9S, and I've got the hybrid holster that's got the, the Kydex shell with the leather backing on it, I think it's a, 
hidden hybrid holsters is what I'm using. It is pretty large. I almost feel like I should almost be just carrying a regular compact instead of a compact, you know, or regular compact instead of a subcompact and just because of the size and stuff. So you got to pretty much make it work for you. Um, holster choice is going to be a big one. Um, and so, you know, cons on something like that or pros on something like that with a subcompact, definitely concealability is a big one. Uh, I don't know if I can really think of a lot, a lot more. People lot. with small hands prefer compact and subcompact guns because they grip them better. True. And some people prefer compact and subcompact because of the weight. Some mm -hmm. of them are well balanced and they deal with the recoil. And some of them, you get that light gun and it's just snappy. So that's another good reason to, to try to shoot it before you buy it, if at all possible. But I, I think that if it's uncomfortable to shoot, I mean, small, ga small guns just don't do it for me. But if I hand somebody a full-size gun who's got little hands or, or not a lot of, uh, of arm or wrist strength, they might say, how can you shoot this thing? Yeah. So it, it does kind of feel that personal preference thing. I think the recoil you could learn to overcome but that's something somebody's going to have to make that effort to do. Oh, definitely, definitely. Because you might not look forward to shooting that gun if it hurts your hand every time you take it out, or you want to do an extended shooting session. And by the time you hit round fifty, you're like, "God, I'm done with this thing." You know? Um, yeah, no, I agree totally, man. That's and I was going to mention the recoil thing. A lot of people think, "Oh, a smaller gun, like smaller recoil," or "Ooh, it's a smaller gun." It might be a little more difficult to actually control and fire comfortably. It really depends. Like my EC9S is a great gun. I love the trigger on it. A little bit snappier than, say, a larger model because obviously weight's a factor, recoil spring size is a factor. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely something that you can run into. Uh, other some, some, are, some are designed to mitigate the recoil, but just because one kind or one, one I don't want to say brand, one kind of uh, compact is, don't be surprised if the next compact you pick up isn't designed that way. Well, prime example, like the two I mentioned earlier, the P238 or the P938. Same gun, one's chambered in 380, one's chambered in 9 millimeter. I got to tell you, even though I like both of them, the P238 is much easier to manage the recoil on it than the same gun in 9 millimeter. And see, sometimes I find 380 to be snappy, but that could also be because it's maybe a smaller form factor compared to like the larger version of the same gun in 9. But yeah, I was kind of curious about that. Um, Another one, again, the P365. I've never fired one i've only held one before p365 and p365 xl i mean it's it's a lot of firepower in a tiny package i those are those are great i know that uh you know some people have had some some firing pin issues with them and pins breaking and things like that and sig might have got that figured out i know there's a little bit of striker drag on the primers that scares people about the p365 but due to the frame and the size and the cycling and the timing of it it's just kind of an inherent characteristic of that particular pistol um, and other guns have that issue, too, with primer drag or with um, uh, striker drag. But, uh, yeah, somebody had mentioned the P365 over there on the YouTube side. Um, compacts. Now, we're talking we're talking subcompacts. Some of the disadvantages of the subcompacts could be the recoil. Capacity. Is capacity really an issue, guys? What do you think? Is capacity really a big deal? Am I at a disadvantage if I've only got seven For plus? For some people, it's a deal breaker. Okay. Uh, they want as much capacity as possible. For me, it isn't, but I think it's just shooting style and, and what my needs are versus somebody else's needs. But I, I've seen that be a, a deal breaker with some people. And a lot of guys say, well, I'll just, I mean, I've always got an extra mag on me when I carry my EC9S. I've actually got the, the eight plus one or the I think it's eight or nine round mag that I got. Ruger makes an extended mag um, that you can buy them off of eBay, actually brand new from Ruger. And uh, I carry an extra mag. A lot of guys say, well, I'll just carry an extra mag. But like, in a multiple assailant situation or <laughs> a SHTF or a riot situation, you might be dealing with a crowd coming after you, you know? And so that really, to me personally, it has me looking at a different carry piece. I want to go back to something with a higher capacity. And I was thinking about maybe going with the CZ P10S um, after watching Ghost Tactical's review on it. And the fact I could add an optic to the top of it, I think that's really cool. Um, you know, I, it's got me thinking maybe, because I'm just seeing, when you see what happens, it seems like so many times anymore, you've got somebody defending themselves from multiple people, whether it's a group of people in a car or it's people that stop your vehicle in the middle of a, of a, of a protest and you're stuck in it or, you know, multiple people, multiple people coming into a home invasion. I almost, I mean, I almost feel like the seven plus one or eight plus one that I'm packing is not adequate. And you could say, well, it's all about shot placement. But when you watch a lot of gunfight videos, 
these people are taking pot shots and hiding behind a car or they're shooting around a corner or they're shooting over a counter. I mean, it's not like you're going to have time to sit there and prop yourself and get properly positioned when you're in a gunfight. So part of me really has me thinking that maybe capacity is going to be something that's going to influence my next compact pistol purchase. Well, now the capacity as, thing. Oh, sorry. As far as, and this is, this is my statement. Nobody else is liable for my statement here. Cause yeah. this surprise, surprise might be a little controversial. The capacity that if you're talking about the crowds rushing up to your car, the capacity you should be worried about is your fuel tank. Run those people over. Don't don't stop and negotiate with them. Don't stop and, and put your fist up and say, I like Black Lives Matter, too. If you feel like you're in danger and you've got a gun and a full gas tank, use that full gas tank. Don't worry about your gun. Face the lawyers later. Face the lawyers have- later. And I don't want to deviate from the topic, but I do have a question, Kingpin, since that's a good point that you're making. I I would do the same thing because I see what people do when they rush a car. Case in point, and it was bad for the driver in this situation. The guy in the white Prius in California was just trying to make a turn to go down the street to go home. They rolled up on his car. They're taking skateboards, bashing his glass, and they're trying to pull him out of the vehicle. He just goes, and then he gets pulled over like five miles down the road and gets arrested. And he was trying to get through a crowd of people that, in my opinion, wanted to kill him. And so I don't understand. Now, that's California. OK, I don't understand that. But, man, you got a good point. I would rather take a chance and go and at least live another day than be torn to pieces by an angry mob that wants to kill you for something you had nothing to do. I you know? would rather be I would rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and clarify that because that's. I understand that statement, but the reality of that statement is you're going to face a lot less charges if you hit somebody with your car. Now, if you're doing 90 miles an hour through a crowd, you're probably going to get But I'm talking about when you're at a stop sign and a crowd rushes up and you maybe break one person's leg or, you know, give somebody a concussion or something like that. The charges you're going to face for that are going to be minimal compared to if you have to start shooting somebody. No, I agree totally, dude. I, I agree totally. And, and you know, just seeing how this stuff happens, you see these shocking videos where somebody just comes around a corner and they accidentally, well, not accidentally, they got the right to be on the road. There's just a crowd right there and they're like, get them. Or they re- they recognize the, the racial profile of that person in the vehicle. Hey, let's go get him. He's not one of us, right? Um, and these things happen. I mean, and so that, and so anyway, yeah, not to get away from the compact and subcompact, but you got a very good point about that. Um. And also another thing, too, if you're looking at getting your first compact or subcompact, and we should just get this out there, really consider going with some concealed carry insurance. And I don't want to make this a discussion about that, but maybe look into getting some sort of liability insurance if you're going to actively carry. Um, I can say, thanks to Defense Dad, I finally, finally got my crap together, got my poop in a group, and purchased my first uh, package deal with a concealed carry insurance company. And I, I just, you know, I decided it was time to do it. It was, you know, for a liability standpoint, I'm in an area that's much more population dense. Maybe there's a higher chance of something happening to me. So I thought maybe it's just time to get smart and get it. What would you say to this, Travis? Yeah. Uh, this is totally hypothetical. So it's just yeah. opinion only. Uh, we're talking about capacity. So yeah. we know that you know, your bigger gun is going to have 17 plus one, you know, 20 round, all that kind of stuff. Your smaller guns are going to be eight, nine, you know, extensions up to 10 rounds probably. What about carrying more than one firearm since it's small, yeah. since it's light, have more than one firearm? I, I have actually done that before in certain situations. I think it's totally possible. It's kind of funny was that Clint Smith from Thunder Ranch says that your backup gun should be bigger than your primary carry. <laughs> and I don't disagree with that. I think that's kind of a cool philosophy. Um, but I that's always an option to get yourself a compact and then keep yourself a subcompact as, as a deep carry, a deep cover carry, something that you just keep for an absolute emergency. Say your primary carry fails or runs out of ammo. You might Maybe you've got some mag compatibility between the compact and the subcompact. I don't know. Um, that's always a possibility. So I think that's pr- you should always have more than one gun if you can. I'm I'm all for it if you don't mind the you know the weight constraints and, and having to balance say two holsters. But you know do like an ankle carry or like a uh, you know like a shin carry or whatever. Um, yeah, there's a lot of aftermarket holster options for people that want to go that route too. So I mean, going the compact or subcompact route is not a bad idea. A magazine extension could be killing two birds with one stone. All mm-hmm. right, you you don't like the capacity. So you want to get a plus two base plate or you want to find an extended mag that's aftermarket or something like that. But then uh, it also could extend the grip depending on, on how the mag is shaped or if there's a, 
an adapter to slide over it or something, and that might make the grip big enough for your hand to handle the, the, the gun well. So you've, you've answered two problems with one, one option. Yeah. Hey, we got some good comments coming in over on the YouTube side. Let's check this out real quick. Uh, let's see here. Plain Reality says, I carry my subcompact 12 plus one, nine millimeter G2C plus one additional mag. And I know you can get for that particular, for a lot of pistols, you can get a plus one or plus two extension. Definitely something to consider. Gun Love and Grandpa says, does my AR9 count as a compact? Oh, absolutely. I think so. Especially, especially you know, if it's if you have it set up as a pistol, right? Uh, what else we have here? DM Foss says, never get out of the car, dude. I cannot agree with you more. Don't try to reason with these people. Just go to where you need to go and deal with the fallout later. That's all I got to say. Here's a good comment. Blue Steel 44. Go to an IDPA match and compare the time score difference between a P229 Glock 19 versus a P365 pistol. It will make you rethink the new compact size thing. So Blue Steel, are you saying that a person should maybe go more towards the Glock 19 form factor versus a P365 or kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, Drusifer says, uh, I think 380 seems more snappy than nine millimeter. It really does depend on the gun. Sandhill shooter is out there. He says the shield 380 easy and shield nine easy are worlds apart in recoil. So Sandhills, I can't remember what you said. Maybe you can chime in on this one. Is the nine easy heavier on the recoil or less? Because I mean, they've probably got different recoil springs, maybe a little bit difference in weight or not. I was looking at both of them last night when I was helping my uh, my friend pick out her first pistol. Uh, you know, maybe consider going with a caliber other than 9mm too, guys. I mean, you know, maybe consider going with a 45 or going with a 40 or a 357 SIG. Or I mean, you've got, you know, you may... I often sometimes wonder if you're going to be losing an advantage if you go with a larger caliber that you're shooting out of a smaller barrel. I don't know. What do you guys think? Should you consider going 40 or maybe 357 SIG or... What do you guys think? For, try them yeah. try before you try them before you buy them and go with what you're comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say, like, we're lucky enough. We have a couple of good gun shops here where there's a big rental fleet, mm -hmm. and you can try all those. Because so, I'm just know, thinking from like from like a tactical standpoint, though, are you gonna gain anything? You're gonna lose capacity if you go. Generally, you're gonna lose. Say you have two models of pistol, ones in a nine and ones in a forty. You might right. lose a couple rounds if you go forty. Are you gonna gain any kind of performance really in the end? if you're shooting those two rounds out of the same size barrel, I don't know. Cause I, I was, did some in-depth reading on 40 versus nine millimeter and, and it, you know, it depends on the ammo selection. You can get some very hot plus B nine. That's going to perform on a level that's very, very close to 40, if not exceeding it. Um, so, I mean, that's part of it too. Part of me would like to get a single stack 45, but it's like, okay, am I really going to gain anything versus a nine that might have double the round count literally? or from running a hotter plus B defensive load through it. So caliber considerations, like you guys said, definitely test it. But if you sit there and say, yeah, I want this in a 10 millimeter or I got to have this in a 45, you do you and you do that. But think about maybe ammo costs in the long run. Are you going to be able to afford to practice with it as much ammo availability uh, performance? Are you really gaining anything? And again, I'm not saying you shouldn't just, you know, there's nothing wrong with going with a larger caliber. I want to, I wish Glock would make a single stack 10 millimeter. I would buy it. But, uh, you know, the caliber thing, too. Again, it really does come down to just simply getting out there and testing, you know, some different models. Um, something else, too, there's a lot of new ammunition coming out on the market for these compact and subcompact pistols. They design it with powders and squib. You might have to chime in on this. Like, I think Federal makes a, uh, a self-defense round that's designed for compact and subcompact pistols. Basically, pistols with a barrel smaller than three and a half inches. They design it maybe a quicker burning powder or you get more of a complete powder burn out of this particular round. I think it's a Federal Hydroshock that I used to see it at Walmart all the time, and it was made for compact pistols. Uh, Squib, could you chime in on that just a little bit at all? What do you think? Is that is that just kind of a marketing gimmick, or do you think they really do? Or you really think they are engineering ammunition? When you look, yeah. When you look at the reload data in your book on the page for the the caliber where it's got your overall length and what primer you're supposed to use, stuff like that, it'll usually tell you what length barrel or even what type of gun that it was the load was tested in. For your reload data and that's for rifle or for handgun because you can get 44 magnum reload data you know from from an eight inch revolver or from a lever action rifle depending on where you look okay. i haven't uh looked too much into uh compact load data but i'm sure it is out there where you know somebody shot it out of a three inch barrel on a revolver or something like that you just have to it, it's it's in like the heading 
at, at the beginning of your data for reloading. As far as them marketing something specific for compact or subcompact, I haven't actually looked for that, but I have seen some of the low recoil options. So if you've got a small gun that's snappy and they offer a low recoil load, you know, buy a box, run it through. As long as it cycles the gun, if it's more comfortable, that might be the way to go. Because for reloaders, we would just load it down to, you know, like what, what um, Dirty Harry said, you know, 44 special light load. All right. So he loads it down so that he can shoot at the range all day with it without wearing out his wrists. But then uh, when he's when he's carrying, you know, he's probably got magnums in that thing. But the same thing could be for your carry gun. You could get a low recoil commercial round for it, or if you reload, just reload it with a lighter charge so that you can take it to the range all day. But you know what you carry with, that's going to be a full power round, and and you know deal with it later. True. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, so yeah, you might start to see a few more different types of ammo out there. There's a good comment that came out. Um, over on the YouTube side here, uh, 357 SIG was engineered to run through a shorter barrel. And, I mean, I'd, I'd love to have, you know, a compact 357 SIG. That's just, to me, that's one of my favorite rounds. Uh, 357 Magnum and 357 SIG, I've always said on the channel, those are two of my favorites. They're just laser beam, very powerful rounds. But then some guys argue and say, well, 40 can do what 357 SIG does, and it's cheaper. And we could go in circles all day on this, and it never ends. I will say this. If you're a little bit in the know about firearms, maybe look into the ballistics information on the uh, the ammunition that you're buying. Now, you got to watch out because when they test that ammo, Many times it's going to be out of a barrel link that you're probably not going to be carrying or that you even shoot on a regular basis. But you can kind of get a nice kind of head-to-head -head comparison. I know Hornady makes a great ballistics just little spreadsheet you can look at that has, you know, the caliber, the, the feet per second, the, the energy at the muzzle. And then they do like a 5-yard, 10-yard, 20-yard, 25-yard uh, rating on the specifications for the ammo so you can see how much energy it's producing. And that's where you can really start to see the differences between the plus P and one caliber versus another caliber. You're like, wow, it... At 20 yards, that larger caliber or caliber ammo, you know, it puts out the same amount or less muzzle energy than my 9 does or my 380 does at that distance. So, like, you know, it's kind of interesting to, to investigate the ammunition a little bit, too. It's not really much of a science. You just look at the numbers and see which one's bigger and go with that, right? Uh, defense Dad, go ahead. Well, so I was just saying, I could be wrong, but uh, SIG has that P P365 line of ammo, too, and I oh. believe that was developed for those guns. I have some of that. Okay, okay. Um, Does it say it's good for any compact pistols? Are they obviously going to say, just use this ammo in our gun, you know? Well, if I remember correctly, it came out around the same time as that gun they developed for it, but common sense would say it's developed for a smaller gun like that. That's still available? I mean, obviously, we have no idea now because... <laughs> yeah, I just got a couple of boxes the other day. A gun-loving grandpa uh, put out, he said Sig, make, SIG makes ammo for the 365 low recoil. Here it is, the V-Crown handgun ammo is what we're looking yeah. at. So, you, yeah, again, you definitely do some. So, seventeen ninety nine for a box of either 20 or 25 over on the Cabell's website. It is sold out. Okay, a box of 20 for seventeen ninety nine. Did you say it was V-Crown? Yeah, it's V-Crown, jacketed hollow point. Now, they may make other uh, other rounds in the series for it, but it's, yeah, six-hour elite performance ammunition, 115 grain. Obnoxious one. Yeah. Obnoxious one shoots V-Crown a lot, so he could probably... I if you're having questions about whether it's any good or not, you probably t touch base with him and he can help you out. I've used that a lot of my tests. Yeah, okay. yeah. What's that? I said I shot quite a bit of it, and what I like about it, it's got well, the way it's made. It's got a fairly round nose on the bullet, so it doesn't get hung up on short feed ramps. Yeah, if you no, look at much more, much more curve to it. Yeah, if you look at the rounds online, if you check out the ammo. Yeah. Yeah, I've shot it in a couple of calibers, and I've been pretty happy with it as far as it, it functioning and, and running. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Defense Dad. Prices on it are very fair. It seems to kind of fall between standard ball ammo and then also like a critical defense or even like a hydroshock price point. So it does kind of fall right in between, too. And there are another thing, too, guys, like I think Winchester does the train and defense line of ammo where they do make, you know, they make very similar rounds, one that you can purchase and you can use it at the range. It might be a little bit cheaper. And then they also make a defense version of that same round just so you're maybe used to it when you're shooting it. It's just kind of neat to kind of have that kind of spread. I mean, if there's something that could be marketed for ammunition, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be marketed. So. All right, guys, so I've got 10 minutes left before I got to go. And so let's just maybe talk about this one. So we're talking about compact and subcompact semi-automatic pistols. Should a person maybe consider going with the revolver? What would be some of the advantages of the revolver versus the compact versus subcompact? What do you guys think? Obviously, we're losing capacity to a point. 
Um, you know, you're maybe limiting yourself to six rounds, five rounds. Should you maybe consider going with a, a compact revolver? I'd use that for a backup. I'd definitely use that for a backup. You know, and it, and it stems back to um, the points that we've been making here uh, quite often, and that mm -hmm. is practice, 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 practice. Get out there. You, know, you found the weapon that you want to buy. You found the weapon you want to try. Go ahead and try it. And after you get it, buy a couple, three, four boxes of ammunition and go to the range. Put that ammunition down range. Then you can turn around and reload that brass. Mm -hmm. So you've got the you've got that option of having, yeah, okay, six rounds. Well, <laughs> in six rounds, I could probably take down four people. Then that's under stress. So, but I'm just speaking for myself because I'm I've been in uh, combat situations. I've I've been in combat uh, competition uh, scenarios with the uh, uh, national pistol team. You know, I've got some experience as far as that goes. So it all boils down to number one, size and fit. Number two, caliber. Number three, being accurate with that weapon. Practice. <laughs> Give Practice. It. You know that gun. Exactly. You know what it's going to do. And you know where those shots are going to go. And you practice it at multiple distances. You are proficient with that firearm. And then keep up on the practice with it. I mean, that... I would say definitely me for me more for the revolver than anything else. I don't shoot revolvers very well. If you ever watch my range videos, I'm, I'm okay. Mediocre best, especially with the double action trigger pull. It takes a lot of practice to really get that. If, you, if you're not going to stage the trigger, you're just going to pull straight through rapid fire. In my opinion, the revolvers are a little more difficult to be accurate with when you're talking like a shorter barrel, uh, smaller grip. So, but I mean, it is an option. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Ruger's got a great line. Smith and Wesson, obviously. Heck, I mean, Taurus even makes the Poly Protector, which is a sub three hundred dollar, three fifty seven, thirty eight special plus P rated revolver that works great. I mean, it's got a very short barrel on it, but it's easy to conceal and it's uh, fairly comfortable to shoot, surprisingly. So oh, yeah. maybe consider going the revolver route. Um, like I said before, but then you kind of run into an issue with a concealed handle model, which or concealed hammer model, which might be a little bit tougher for you to shoot because you can't go single action with it. It's going to be stuck in a double action full pull. Um, but again, well, if, you've got a, if you've got a double action, it's best to try to, uh, try to practice double action with it. I'll give you a little giggle. <laughs> uh, my brother-in-law and I got into a, a contest, yakking contest about the accuracy of the 45 ACP. And uh, I just come back from a match, so I was pretty well tuned in. I had a state-issued rack grade 45 1911. And uh, he says, you can't hit the broad side of the barn with that thing. I says, really? I say, let's say you take your hat, put it on the bank down at 100 yards, and we'll see see just how far this thing can be accurate. Now, rack grade means very little modification, fixed sights the whole nine yards. But I knew yeah. what that pistol would do. He put his hat down there. Well, we went back to the back to the bench. I drew and fired. He says, you missed it. I says, um, I think you better get down there and look at it. And uh, he picked his hat up. He had a nice 45 caliber bullet hole that top of that cap. Yeah. So he didn't say, you know, that's not going to hit anything at the broad side of a barn ever again to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. I wouldn't challenge you anyway. If you're a competitive <laughs> shooter, I don't know why he even went there. I mean, these in-laws. Oh, he was being a smart aleck. That's oh, yeah. Mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I've seen I've seen YouTube videos from, from YouTubers I've been following for a long time. That will go out to 100 yards, and they'll hit, you know, a six-inch plate at 100 yards with the handgun. I mean, it, it is. If you know the gun and you practice with it, well, you can be. You can say, that'll never happen. No, if you know the gun, you know what it can do, especially if you practice with it. it it's it's possible. So now we're not saying shoot, shoot that subcompact out to 100 yards because, you know, that's maybe not a record. I'd like to see you try that with my Jimenez JA-22. That's what I'd like to see. <laughs> Give me some time with it. I can probably oh, God, pull it down. I know. I know. You've been <laughs> pennies off that thing, right? Yeah. Get the from Snob. What's that? Get the Altor from Snob. Yeah, I get the Altor, the single <laughs> shot uh, freedom gun. <laughs> well, I got a question. What about malfunctions? Because if you mm. think about it, if you're at the range – and even whether it's double action or single action, when you pull the trigger on a revolver and a round doesn't go off, you can just pull right through again. With a basic semi-automatic, you got to manipulate the slide, drop the magazine, different stuff like that. How do you feel about, you know, the, the malfunction edge of the revolver for a carry gun versus the semi-auto? 
I, I mean, well, you just pull the trigger a second time and you have another round ready to go if it doesn't go bang the first time. But no, like if the timing is off or there's something mechanical about it that fails, you're kind of stuck there. You know, there's there's the pot. I mean, I don't I would think the revolver would function, but a revolver is a tool just like anything and it could possibly fail. I mean, that is a possibility. Oh, too. Yeah. Um, I will say this, though, just malfunctions in general, the more you practice with it, you know, maybe load some dummy rounds in it or load some spent casings in it so you can practice and practice clearing uh, with me. And I, and I don't want to brag, but I've just noticed it's just become a – and maybe it's not the safest thing in the world because you should maybe wait a few seconds if the round doesn't go off. But for me at the range, if the gun doesn't go bag, I just instinctually, you know, just rack the slide, you know, tack wrap. No, if it if – it, I know how to clear it quickly because I've, I've practiced enough with it. You can get used to it eventually. So um, – oh, yeah. but, yeah, no, I do agree with the malfunction thing. I – you know, there's always that possibility something could happen. And, you know, you could have your your your, your semi-auto could fail too. There's a lot of things that could go wrong with it. Um, yeah, I was kind of just talking about just the, the basic, there's a failure with the round, like nothing broke on the gun. It's just, you, yeah. you the primer struck, the round didn't go off or like in a semi-auto, you got a failure to feed or a failure to eject or the round just didn't go off. The problem with the revolver is, you know, say that's like your last one and it doesn't go off and you need to empty. I mean, you need to practice reloads and stuff like that too. I, yeah, I mean, that's, that is always a possibility, but the good thing with the revolver is you can just pull the trigger again on some guns. You would have to recharge the weapon in order for the trigger to work unless it's got a second strike capability, like say the, the Taurus G2C or the G3C, you know, it'll automatically have that second strike on it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree completely. So that's always a possibility of something that can happen, which is another reason why you should carry two guns in case your primary weapon should fail. Because I've had guns not go bang for me, and that's not a good feeling when you're at the range. It's like, what if this was a life or death situation and it didn't fire, or I got the first shot off and now it jammed, or I had a failure to eject, right? And I think a lot of that really just does come down to to practice and training with the weapon. Maybe load some dummy rounds in it the next time you go to the range so that you can you can practice, you know, or have a friend. If a friend's with you, have him load the mag or her load the mag for you and put some dummy rounds in there so you don't know when it's going to fail, especially if you're running some kind of drills or anything. You have to, you know, you have to learn how to clear it. So, um, yeah, no, I agree completely, man. Um, real quick, I just want to check out some of the YouTube comments before we call it here. Um, there was a video, let's see, Defense Dad, you had mentioned that... There's a video out there on YouTube, Beyond Seclusion, uh, another Nebraskan out there hits a target at 200 yards with the Ruger American Competition. Yeah, that American Competition model is very sweet. What's that? One-handed, by the way. Oh, my God. What's he shooting at, like a six-inch gong or, or what? What? I don't know. He's, got, he's, he's not too far from here, and he's got he's got a nice channel, but he's a uh, – he shoots off his back deck on where he lives. It's it's just he has. Oh, everybody a, does that in Nebraska. If you're outside of city limits, that <laughs> well, he's got you know metal targets set up at yeah. 1500, 200. But he puts out some yeah, good but, stuff. But yeah, I just watched it the other day. I was like, man, that's a that's a nice shot at 200 yards, one handed. Must have a decent acreage to be able to take shots like that too. That or he's got permission from the farmer next 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 lot over to shoot into his field. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see comments. What do we got here? Uh, Gun loving grandpa says I get my wife to load my mags and put snap caps in it, so I don't don't know when they're going to fail. Um, Philo says I think revolvers work really really well at hands on distance. Uh, the best three carry guns, in my opinion, for a new shooter: the M&P Easy, Glock forty three X, or Sig three sixty five. And again, it does really come down to personal preference. But that you know that's always that's always a great one. Uh, great suggestions there, Nebraska Gun Freak. Um, Ooh, let's see here. Poor conservative says, if you can shoot, revolvers work. Work. If you suck, absolutely not, right? If you're considering a revolver, consider double action only. Pocket carry, okay? Advantage of revolvers is that they're very cool. It's also down to what you guys are saying. It's also down what you guys are saying about what it does to someone's wrist or hand or if they have a prior injury or arthritis along with the size of the gun. Yeah, you definitely need to. Um, if you can't even chamber the first round because of arthritis issues, you want to look into a different model. Uh, let's see. Philo says blue steels. He says, um, I find 357 SIG so loud out of two or three inch barrels. Depends if you're shooting indoors, outdoors in a defensive situation, it's not going to matter, but you got a good point. Uh, gun loving grandpa says SIG makes ammo just for the 365 low recoil. There you go. Uh, you want a faster burning powder in a shorter barrel. This is true. All right. So guys, we're going to go ahead, um, and call it Sam of Anarchy says failure to maintain your firearm is also a factor in malfunctions. You know, and again, I get a lot of people that ask me questions on the YouTube channel. How often should I clean my gun? I do it after every range trip because I want to look inside the frame. I want to look at that guide rod. I want to check the barrel. I want to make sure there's no cracks or stress fractures or anything broken inside. Nothing 
jiggling around after I take it to the range. I want to make sure that gun's going to be functional when I need to use it. And there's some people that will never clean their gun. And that's totally cool. If you don't do it, you don't clean your weapon, that's 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 fine. You do you. But uh, for me, it's after every range trip, just more of a kind of an OCD thing. And then also kind of a personal preference with just making sure that everything is secure when I put that gun back together. So. All right, guys, I think we'll go ahead and call it. My hour's up. I got to get moving here. I do apologize. We will definitely meet next week. We can always talk about this uh, topic again in next week's discussion if we need to. So let's let the panel go ahead and put their final plugs in, and we'll let you guys start your Saturday. Defense Dad, what do you got to say, bud? Oh, everybody have a good day. If you haven't subscribed to everybody else's channels, check them out. Everybody has good content, and shoot safe. Right on, man, right on. Okay, Squibby, any final comments before we go? Uh, no, just thanks for the invite as usual, and uh, everybody have a good weekend. Right on, man. Sounds good. Sounds good. Kingpin, any final plugs, brother? Thanks for having me. Good to see everybody. Uh, Rick's Life, 3 p.m. Eastern, the only time zone that matters. Uh, G23, 6 p.m. Eastern, the only time zone that matters. Oh, my gosh. You guys are such e- – I was thinking about this. If you're pro <laughs> East Coast time zone, that would make you like an Eastist. Is there an Eastist? Like, a, you know, like you're not a racist, but you're an Eastist. So if you're if you're Central time zone, you're a centralist. If you're a mountain – if you're pro mountain time zone, then you're a mountainist. And so if you're in the Pacific time zone, if you're in California, does that make you a pacifist? But I'm bummed. I just thought that was kind of funny. Pacifist, California liberals. I tried. All right. Uh, <laughs> shot. Anything you want to say? Can you get on me about my dad jokes? What's that? You know – I made that one up this morning when I was getting ready. So, kidding, so tra- tra- Travis, don't, don't quit your day job. Oh, I won't. Trust me. I never will because there's nothing else for me <laughs> I do. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, man. Defense Dad, next time you guys are at the range together, you might want to bring one of those really long canes so you can pull him out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm actually looking at making one of those with a knife that comes out. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 like one of those ones like they use on TV where they pull the guy off the, sh- the stage. Well, I am a woodworker after all. All right, man. All right. Just get a scythe while you're at it, you know, get a sickle or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Single shot. Anything you want to say before we go? Oh, everybody take care. Be safe. Stay safe. And uh, remember that America moves by truck. We'll oh, be... Putting up some new stuff there. As soon as I can get squared away there at the house, I'm going back that way this time to uh, get this truck serviced. And, awesome. And I'm going to take some time there. Things are pretty busy when you're all by yourself. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. I agree. Oh, all right. easy, folks. Always, always, always. Uh, so anyway, guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. Hopefully we gave you some, some great, useful information. And again, a lot of what we have, a lot of what we met, what we mentioned is personal preference, but it always comes down to just going to the range, testing a variety of models, or if you've got a family member that, you know, is a fan of firearms or a significant other, and you want to, you know, there's always somebody that's willing to share or take a firearm with you to the range and test it out a little bit. So just look around. You can definitely make it happen. Um, okay, so joining us today on the YouTube side, we had a little Kingpin action, some G23, some Keith Gregory, Pat Hirsch in the house, DM Foss, Tacos and French Fries, Gun Loving Grandpa, Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep Guy, always in the house, Sam Sam of Anarchy 92, Philo, Poor Conservative, Uplift Mofo Party Plan, Nebraska Gun Freak, uh, Poor Conservative, DM Foss, Blue Steel 44. Got a great crowd this morning. A lot of the usual suspects, I guess we could say. Uh, anybody else out there that we missed? I think we had a little Scott P79 going on. Plain reality in the house. Uh, let's see here. I think that's probably probably about it. G23. Guess I didn't mention it. Uh, I think that Defense Dad's out there and over here. John Lowell's out there. Sand Hill Shooter. Good to see you this morning, bud. KR. Ozzy Orsborne. Drusifer. And I think that's probably about it. And Jason Stewart. All right. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. This has been episode number 157. If this works out, we will meet you guys again next week at the same time. I know our family's got a major firearm event coming up next week. And so hopefully I'll be able to do the show from 8 to 9. If not, I'll definitely give you guys a heads up. But uh, that's it. So thanks for watching. Shout out to SS Pond for their support of the channel. Guys, I want you to have fun. Be safe. Get out there and do some shooting. And as you know, we will see you soon. Y'all take care, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Alicia. Bye, Alicia. Adios, Alicia. Adios. Hasta luego.